Hello, everyone. Uh, hi. Uh, my name is Ramzi Ruigi. I'm the chair of the Department of Middle East Studies here at USC. And it is my great pleasure to welcome you uh, to, a, to the second part of a great event that we have here at the library. Um, and I would like to um, extend thanks to people um, at the library and the Farhang Foundation who are here, who, are, who helped organize, who, who helped make this event uh, happen. Um, Dr. Bahavar uh, representing the library, and Ali Reza here, um, Ardekani, who is uh, from the Farhang Foundation. Today we have a, a great panel of speakers on, um, on uh, weddings uh, in Iranian culture, focusing on the uh, Qajar and maybe a little bit early, a little bit late. Uh, period. Um, they, uh, they look like they are fantastic, uh, exciting papers. I look forward to listening to these presentations. Uh, I would like to recognize Dr. Pe uh, Pedram Khos Khosrojad, who is, who helped, um, who is, who I think initiated uh, this event, who is behind it, who is, uh, who has also published a great deal about this material, who is uh, a great expert uh, internationally uh, recognized expert on uh, on the material. Maybe he could say a few things. Uh, thank, thank you. you. Thank you Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Ramzi. Uh, it's great honor for me to have all of you here with this great two events, which this part is the second one, but not the last one, uh, definitely. First of all, I should say thank you, Farhang Foundation, Executive Director, Mr. Eliza Ardakani. Thank you so much. And the crew, Tanaz and Negar. Thank you, really. And also, uh, Emrani sisters, uh, both, uh, Hale and Mahda. Uh, maybe you were not here yesterday in the reception opening, but I would like to tell you a little bit about the story of the exhibition and this talk program. It was about a year and a half ago that uh, Mahda Emrani, one of the members of Farhang uh, Iranian Studies uh, program, uh, was in touch with me and talked about a very interesting project that Farhang is running now, once upon a time, Yekibud Yekinabud, which uh, is for covering the oral history and family history of Iranians uh, all around the world, but mostly in LA. And we had a discussion what we can do and from where we can begin. So as a social anthropologist, I explained that for human community, three major things are important, uh, the birth, the death, and the marriage. So, and in Iranian and Persian culture, wedding is very joyful, uh, knowing the fact that uh, in Iran and out of Iran, we have uh, religious minorities, uh, ethnical diversities, and mixed uh, marriage. So why we don't begin with wedding, especially among uh, people in LA? We know many of us married uh, with Americans, non-Americans, different religions. And the idea was good, actually. And uh, Farhang worked very hard to send the submission to receive objects, materials, arts, material, cultural wedding uh, from you, the families here. And during a year, uh, we received the objects, and after that, we selected those that we thought are good for our event, the exhibition that you have downstairs, which will continue till the end of May. Don't hesitate to go and visit it after talk or the day after, I don't know. So, um, and also, since 15 years ago, I began to collect, as an anthropologist, the objects of wedding, mostly photographs uh, uh, and textiles, uh, silk, or the other browseries that you can see downstairs were used in the wedding table materials. And I knew one day we will have one exhibition that happened here in LA. Thank you, Farhang Foundation. Thank you, Mr. Ardakani. So what we have here, uh, of course, after the talk, we will be here. If you have any questions or if you need a tour in exhibition, I'm happy to do that for you. Um, and also, uh, I need to thank especially library of uh, here, uh, Tyson and Anna Marie. I don't know if they are here or not. I don't see them, but thank you so much for running the exhibition together. Thank you, Tyson. And without you, we never could do this. And thank you, Professor Bahavar, 
uh, from the beginning. Uh, really, you were supportive of this project, and I'm sure collaboration between Farhang and uh, university will flourish very soon and fast. So uh, the idea of having this uh, talk day was put a little bit in context for you, especially I see here as students, uh, what's the tradition or traditions of wedding in Persian culture, mostly back to Qajar dynasty. The dynasty before maybe real modernization of Iran or pre-modern area, Professor Eskandari Qajar and other colleagues can correct me here, but we have uh, four top-rate uh, speakers. Uh, first, we begin with Professor Shahla Bahavar, who initiated the collection of Iranian studies in USC, the history, what we have here, documents, books, films, and the future where we are going. And also after that, we begin, and I'm honored that Professor Iskandari Qajar accepted to give us a, a very beautiful uh, story about the wedding uh, from the beginning and maybe till the end of Qajar a dynasty inside the royal court and the harems. Uh, second speaker, we have a very uh, important uh, scholar and a friend and colleague from USC, Department of Western Studies, Dr. Hani Khafipur, who will talk about the wedding ceremonies of Persian during Safavid uh, area. And it's very, I'm honored really and flattered that we have Dr. Amir Hussein Apur Jawadi, the only or one of the only ethnomusicologist of Iran. I should emphasize that we don't have many. Uh, Amir Hussain is really, really one of them who work on Qajar music and it's rare that someone can contribute on Qajar wedding music. Thank you, Amir Hussain. It's really rare. I'm really flattered and thank you so much. And in the end, if you have time, I will talk a little bit about exhibition and put in the context why the family photographs and objects and materials of the wedding are important and how we can transfer the message to our new generation to preserve them to, for, you know, because more and more from material we are going to digital. Why this exhibition is important and how we can encourage our grandparents and children to take care of them. Thank you so much. And without any further, I go to introduce our first speaker, Professor Shahla Bahavar. Uh, Professor Shahla Bahavar uh, serves as Director of Social and Behavioral Science at the USC Libraries. She is a recipient of the American Library Association and the Carnegie's Corporation of New York's I Love My Liberation Award in two... Librarian, sorry. <laughs> Librarian Award, sorry. In 2014. She is the only librarian from USC and the second librarian in California academic institutions to receive this prestigious national award. Without any further, I invite Professor Shahla Bahavar, who will uh, talk about introduction to the Persian collection at USC libraries. Please join me to welcome Professor Bahavar. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Hosun Yajad. It's my pleasure to be here um, at this uh, happy occasion. I received what more you know, happier than this event. Uh, it's totally exciting. Um, uh, we had the opening ceremony for reception for the exhibit downstairs yesterday. My God, it was just so fabulous. It was big success, big, big, huge success. So. Um, I'd like to echo um, uh, Dr. Khosrowshah's comment on um, thanking again uh, Farhang Foundation, Middle East Studies Department, and USC Libraries for collaborating on this uh, project. Believe it or not, we started the talk last year this time. Um, Dr. Rugi, um, I'm thankful to him for uh, getting me involved last year, like, you know, getting my perspective, like, how can we collaborate on this? So the three uh, entities uh, worked on, hard on this, and like now you see today the uh, product of our uh, collaboration. So um, again, uh, special thanks to all um, parties involved in this. My special thanks to um, 
uh, Tyson Gaskell, Patty Johnson, and uh, Anna Marie uh, Maxwell for their really hard work uh, throughout this uh, exhibition and throughout this project. And thank you um, to everyone who attended yesterday. And so um, just uh, we have, you know, fabulous speakers lined up. So I like to make uh, my comments short so we have more time for really interesting stuff. But um, this is, I'd like to take this opportunity to um, introduce and to promote our uh, Persian language collection, which many, after all these years that, like seven years that I've been building this collection, may not be aware of, like you know, this collection exists at USC. So um, uh, this is sort of like, you know, an introduction. So um, the background uh, and the history behind it goes back to initiation of Iranian um, studies uh, 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 initiative at USC. This was a joint um, partnership between um, USC Dornsife College and um, Farhang Foundation that it was a three-phase uh, um, initiative. The phase one was establishment of uh, Persian language courses at USC. And the pay, uh, phase two was uh, establishing um, Iranian studies as a minor at USC. So uh, phase three is um, offering um, Iranian studies as a degree program, which is on the way. You know, it's happening. Tarhang Foundation is working on that. So um, uh, in 2010, uh, per agreement between uh, Dornsife College and Farhang Foundation, uh, Persian language uh, courses were established. So uh, this is the, uh, uh, you know, image from there. And then later on, um, another, uh, collaborative uh, agreement and initiative was signed between um, the Dornsife and the uh, Farhang Foundation on initiating uh, Iranian studies program uh, as minor degree, which uh, Dr. Khafipur is, you know, uh, faculty of that program. So um, the establishment of the collection goes back you know, to when in 2010, when the uh, Persian language courses were established uh, in 2011, fall 2011, for the first time, Persian language courses were offered at USC. Dr. Payman Nujumian was hired at the time um, to teach uh, Persian language courses. So um, being the uh, only Iranian librarian at USC, on top of my many hats that I wear, like you know, my director, my head, my librarian, my teaching, um, I was um, assigned this responsibility uh, to start and uh, build this uh, Persian language collection to support our um, you know, Persian language courses and Iranian studies program. So that's how we got this, uh, you know, started. So library, gave, I got uh, special funding from the library to build a Persian language collection from scratch. There was nothing at that time at USC. So in 2012, I started building this collection. Um, so quickly, I start, established my uh, liaison responsibilities with Persian faculty, as well as um, uh, report with them uh, on building this collection. Um, so, um, for, uh, this was a collaboration that uh, you know, uh, by uh, work, I worked with them on getting the recommendation list. So, um, and I built on that. Like every year, every year, I got funding and uh, I bought materials. Uh, which the initial emphasis of the collection was on literature and uh, Persian literature and Persian language because it was supposed to uh, uh, support the uh, uh, Persian language courses that uh, you know, uh, were offered at USC. But you know, over the years um, since, uh, since then, I have also bought 
Persian collection on other subject areas like history, like you know, culture, politics, art, and so on. Believe it or not, we still we also have uh, Rosa Montezemi's cookbook here, which is very popular. Yes, uh, very, very popular. It goes out a lot. Uh, so, um, but uh, the point is like, you know, the collection, the funding uh, allocation that I had received, it was for building uh, Farsi language or Persian language materials. English language materials, you know, on the, any of these, uh, uh, you know, um, Iranian studies areas would fall, you know, under subject librarian, you know, uh, who, uh, you know, uh, responsible for their own subject area. Also, um, I have bought a lot of uh, you know, audiovisual materials. We have a lot of films, documentaries. Um, so the books are in Dohini Library, in this library. Um, but the um, uh, audiovisual materials are in Levy Library. And they go out for, for one week. Students can check it out, take it to class, or take it home. So these are used for in their classes. Uh, you know, uh, they get used a lot. Um, I also um, have received, uh, you know, a few um, gift uh, donations, books uh, from uh, donors that, you know, these are uh, gift donations enhance our gaps in our collection for the subject areas that, you know, uh, we have gaps. So um, I have uh, continued with this. Um, one challenge that we have which, uh, you know, I have survived so far, is like there is no one at uh, the, in the technical services with language skills to process this collection. So every year I hire, you know, we hire a uh, student assistant with language skills to help us, uh, you know, uh, to catalog and process these collections and make them available for our users. So uh, that's something that we have to live with, you know, me, you know. I'm the only one, and I can only do so much. <laughs> um, so, um, as I mentioned, like, you know, um, our uh, collection emphasis is on uh, literature and language, and this is like, you know, a selective, a sampling list of some major, like, you know, some uh, poets, like, you know, from early centuries. So we have everything, old works of, like, you know, uh, Hafez, Saidi, Nizami, Rumi, and so on, you know. So they are all uh, complete collections on here. Like, you know, this is just the sampling that I just wanted to uh, let you know, like, you know, what we have. We have also a rich collection of contemporary poets, like in anything from Shamlu, um, Simin Behbahani, Farooq Farooq, Nader Nader, Sohrab Sepehri, and so on. Um, we have also, um, I collect, and we have a uh, rich collection of uh, authors and novelists' work, like you know, short stories that is used a lot in um, Persian language courses, like you know, students, you know, um, and uh, so these are like you know some uh, sam sampling of uh, some of the uh, authors and novelists that we have, but you know, we have full collection of all of them. So this is the, a view from the uh, stacks, uh, like, you know, book stacks. Uh, Persian books are not uh, shelved separately from the rest of the collection. They are interfiled, uh, you know, um, in, the, uh, in the book stack, in Dohini book stacks, along with other books in the same subject area, like literature books, you know, same uh, politics, you know, with other uh, books in politics and so on. So um, it's huge, you know, students are welcome to uh, uh, go and browse in the stacks and, uh, you know, um, depending on the subject area and uh, find uh, books that way. I also, uh, we have a lot of, you know, um, I have acquired uh, in, uh, reference books like encyclopedias and dictionaries. Like you know, I we have a complete set of Loratname uh, de Choda, which is encyclopedic uh, type dictionary. Danishname um, Iran, which is this is the yeah, newly published uh, you know um, encyclopedia that uh, four vol volumes is of you know and it's you know ongoing and I'm uh, purchasing every time that new. 
uh, edition comes out, and also um, other uh, you know different types of dictionaries. Uh, Encyclopedia Iranica, which is an online database that we have access to, also. So this is a view um, of the uh, reference collection. Reference books are in the reference room. Uh, on the first floor of Doheny, there is a big reading room. So that's where the reference collection is. And these uh, reference books are you know, um, shelved there, and they are available for use. So um, while I was building this, I was looking also at uh, ways of promoting the collection and you know, looking for opportunities to um, promote um, the use. So I'm thankful to Dr. Najumian for inviting me to Urdian uh, to um, tea table events that uh, you know they had at Middle East Studies Department. So that was a, a spark for me, you know, to get connected with uh, Iranian students in the uh, Persian language courses, you know, uh, network, and then spread the word around about the uh, availability of this collection at USC libraries. So um, one of the um, events that you know we uh, jointly um, organized, and um, it was the two years ago that I came up with this idea of having a you know launch event. So uh, we this was a collaboration between Middle East Studies Department and uh, USC Libraries. So this was over lunch, and we invited uh, we served Persian food. And we invited uh, all students in uh, Iranian studies and Persian language uh, courses, uh, Iranian faculty, staff. So over 50 uh, people. You know, it was organized actually in uh, Doheny Library, at one of our conference rooms in Doheny. So what I had done, but I had pulled um, some sample, like you know, poetry books, um, you know, um, short story, dictionaries, encyclopedias, AV materials, films, you know, um, you know, uh, and for display on the table. So um, this was um, sponsored by uh, you know both libraries and the uh, Middle East Studies Department. So Dr. Nujumian and I. You know, presented and discussed the uh, value of this collection and uh, how they uh, can they can use. So this was really um, you know a good um, opportunity to get our community uh, you know uh, to know like you know what's available still. You know, despite all of this that we are doing still. You know, uh, I'm doing my best, but you know uh, we need to do better. You know. Uh, you know, outreach to our community about this collection. Another uh, thing that is happening, and I'm thankful to Dr. Nujumian, is um, he brings, uh, every semester, he brings his class to, uh, on a field trip to Doheny. Uh, so they go to book stacks uh, where Persian collection is, and, um, and it, as a class assignment, you know, they uh, look and then they find materials that way. So this is the uh, a visit that they had uh, two years ago in 2017 that, as you can see, students are browsing in the stacks and uh, using the uh, collections. So um, I've been, uh, you know, we are uh, trying to do more of this step and also uh, it's continuing my work on the building the collection and filling the gaps and uh, also um, trying to promote it. It's just ongoing uh, job, but you know, it's something that I really enjoy doing. So that was sort of like, you know, my, I meant to uh, give this uh, introduction to, uh, you know, uh, to our Persian collection. That's my contact information. If you have any questions, I'll be more than happy to answer. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Bahavar. Uh, please keep your questions for the end of the uh, program so, and make some notes so you can address the speakers in the end for have answer and discussions. So now uh, I would like to introduce our second speaker, Professor Manishir Eskandari Ghajar. Professor Eskandari Ghajar is Professor of Political Science and Director and Founder of the Middle East Studies Program at Santa Barbara City College. 
For the last 20 years, he has led the International Cultural Studies Association, IQSA, which organizes conferences of Qajar Iran around the world and publishes the journal Qajar Studies. In 1999, he founded IQSA together with Farid Dune Barjaste and the late Professor Majid Tehranian. Professor Iskandari Qajar has published extensively on the Qajar era, including his latest book, a translation of the Tarikh Azudi, entitled Life and the Court of the Qajar Shahs. He is currently working on a translation of a memoir about life and the court of Nasruddin Shah. Uh, I invite Professor Manisher Qajar, who will talk about wedding ceremonies at the court of the early Qajar Shahs. Please. Thank you very much for this introduction. Um, I too would like to thank the organizers of this conference, uh, Farhang Foundation and Mr. Ardekani, and my colleagues at USC. But it goes without saying that we have to thank this champion, um, Professor Khosro Nejad. Um, Pedram is not only a, a scholar, but he's also an artist. And um, if you have seen what he has done downstairs, this is the eye of an artist adding um, academic um, muscle to what he does. So our deepest thanks to you for bringing this to life, Bedram Jan. Um, I'm very happy to be asked to speak on this uh, topic. I have written on um, novellas by my ancestor, Yahya Mirza Iskandari, on a novel that he wrote, uh, he was one of the constitutionalists and one of the founders of the constitutional movement. Um, it was Arusia Mehrangiz, which is available in some of the old newspapers of Iran. Um, and when uh, Pedram asked me to give this talk on marriages and speak on this matter, it was, uh, it was with great joy that I accepted because I think it is very important that at this point we leave behind some of the politics that uh, pushed the Rajar era in the background and, and um, made it uh, more or less neglected in academic studies. Uh, when uh, Professor Diba gave her um, talk and had the exhibit at, um, Brooklyn, at the Brooklyn Museum, I was able to ask both Professors Amanat and Professor Yarshater, the late Professor Yarshater, who were there, as to why it is that we are finally talking about the Rajar era. And um, I asked that question of Professor Amanat, but Professor Yarshater stepped in and said, um, because we now have distance. And um, I'm happy that we now have enough distance to be able to talk about the Rajar era without the um, usual politics. And so Pedram's work in um, safeguarding the material culture of the Rajar era. And talks like these and conferences and exhibits like these are very important to safeguard for us um, an era that gave us many of the um, symbols, many of the customs, many of the traditions that we Iranians still uh, practice or engaged in, even though we may not recall where that origin um, is from. And uh, this talk that I uh, give today, this brief talk that I will give today, is about the uh, ceremonies of the court of the Rajars. Many of the things that I am mentioning here do not exist anymore and cannot exist as a result of the fact that we don't even have a court anymore in Iran. Um, but uh, some of you who are familiar with Iranian traditions will recognize some of these vignettes as uh, speaking from almost long lost memories. As an academic, I couldn't help myself to also engage in a little bit of etymology and discussion of terms, given that the title of this uh, conference and of the exhibit is Arusi. So allow me please to start with that. Um, on the distinction between the word Ard and Arusi in Persian. There are steps in the Persian tradition leading to the formal union of couples that precede the ceremony of the Ard which are more or less similar to Western traditions, such as Khostegari and Namzadi, 
the formal asking of the hand of the bride and the engagement of the couple. But the main distinction I wish to draw here is between the two words ard and arusi, which are both referred to in English as wedding. In the Persian language, ard refers to the exchange of vows between the bride and the groom and the formal bestowal of the terms husband and wife upon them. In other words, this refers to what in the West is called the marriage or wedding ceremony, which is carried out in the presence of, of an officiant and witnesses and signals and signifies the familial, social, legal, religious approval of the union. Legal because it is the state that registers and sanctions the couple as married and now grants them certain rights that, are, that they otherwise would not have. Arusi, on the other hand, specifically refers to what occurs after the ceremony of the art. It thus refers to both the celebrations that are intended for the guests, which occur after the exchange of vows between the couple, and to the consummation of the marriage, which transitions the couple from individuals for whom, up to that point in traditional society, physical sexual contact was proscribed, to a married couple for whom physical sexual contact now has familial social, legal, and religious approval. The second aspect of Arusi also then regularizes the potential result of that contact as a legitimate member of that society, as the words Haramzadeh and Halalzadeh in Persian clearly indicate. The further importance, importance of the distinction between Ard and Arusi in Persian is also attested to by this phrase, Ard kardant vali hanuz Arusi na kardant. They have engaged marriage vows, but they have not yet consummated the marriage. And that the consummation of the marriage, or at least the sharing of the wedding bed on the wedding night, in the end, actually completes the cycle initiated by the first step of asking for the hand of the intended. A second point that I wish to draw attention to is, um, in the Islamic tradition, the various distinctions that we have on various types of marriages. A further distinction exists in the traditional Islamic, Arabic, and Persian traditions, and that is the distinction between the different types of legally sanctioned marriages. In the Islamic tradition, two types of marriages are acknowledged with different degrees of sanction appro or approval between the Sunni and Shia sects of Islam. In Arabic, these two types of marriages are referred to as nikah and mutah, permanent marriage and marriage for mutah or pleasure. Without going to the theology or the Quranic exegesis for these terms, Sunnis tend to recognize only nikah marriage. But given that Sunni rulers had and still have more than four Quranic allowable wives, this complicates the matter greatly without an acknowledgement of the mutah in that tradition as well. In Shia Islam, the two types of marriage are referred to as ardi and sireh, permanent and temporary marriages. And in this context and distinction, it is in this context and distinction um, that I wish to talk about the marriages in the uh, courts of the early Rajars. Until the 20th century, in Iran, royal court marriages involved both Ardi and Sireh marriages. And unlike latter-day opprobria attached to the term Sireh or temporary marriage, many of the Sireh marriages at the royal court were between the Shah and princesses or aristocratic women. And those that were not between the Shah and women of high birth were, for the Shah, marriages of choice rather than of dynastic demand or political necessity. Several of these marriages were also, and notably so, marriages of love, as attested to by the memoir of Fatari Shah's son, Sultan Ahmad Mirza Azodid Dole, the Tariq Azodi. Additionally, even though Sireh marriages was not the preferred form of marriage for the bride, these were nevertheless marriages to the king or to one of his sons, which resulted in legitimate royal descendants and princely lineages that continue to this day. And in that, if nothing else, it became a huge advantage to the wife who now was the mother of a prince or princess of the royal house. Notable examples of this are the marriage between Sarbe Jahan Khanum, the daughter of Fatali Shah, who was the daughter of a Sire marriage of Fatali Shah to a servant of the royal household, to Agha Khan Mahalati, giving us the line of the Ismaili Imams known today as the Agha Khans, or that between Ziba Cher Khanum Gorji and Fatali Shah, which resulted in the birth of one of his most famous sons, Muhammad Ali Mirza Dolat Shah, 
or the marriage between the Shah and perhaps the most famous of all of his wives, Tavus Khanum Tajid Dole, the mother of Sultan Ahmad Mirza, the author of the Tariq Azadi, from which I draw many of the, um, all of the vignettes that I will mention um, subsequently. The same was true of marriages of subsequent Shahs, notably of Muhammad Shah Ghajar, the grandson of Fat Ali Shah and father of Nasuddin Shah from uh, his Ahdi wife and queen uh, Mahda Uliya. Nasuddin Shah's prominent brothers and rivals, Abbas Mirza Mulkara and Abdul Samad Mirza Ezid Dole, were sons of Sireh wives of Muhammad Shah. And in turn, Nasuddin Shah's senior son, Mas'ud Mirza Zel Sultan, was the son of a Sireh wife, but nevertheless one of the most important princes in the Nasiri period, and rival to both his father and to his two younger brothers, Crown Prince Muzaffaruddin Mirza and Kamran Mirza, Naib Saltane, who also incidentally was the son of a Sire wife of Nasuddin Shah, Munir Saltane. It is also important to remember that both the court of Fath Ali Shah and at the court of Nasuddin Shah, wives who were in fact Sire wives were considered and addressed as queens, not just by the court, but also by foreign rulers and embassies. In the case of Fath Ali Shah, as we will see in, uh, in the vignette below, it was Agha Baji, the daughter of Ibrahim Khan, the governor of Shusha. And in the case of Nasuddin Shah, it was Fatima Khanum Anis Dole, the Shah's favorite wife. Also of note regarding the wedding rituals of the early Rajar courts is the fact that the Rajars were of tribal origin and that they maintained many of their tribal rituals and practices once they became dynastic rulers. These traces of tribal customs remained all the way to Nasuddin Shah's times as attested to um, by his grandson Dustali Khan Muayyar al Mamalek, who in turn, like his elder cousin, also wrote a memoir about the court of his grandfather. In fact, the royal wedding of the mother of Dustali Khan, Princess Fatima Khanum Esmat Dole, uh, about which there are uh, pictures in this exhibition prominently displayed, was one of the most storied and lavish weddings of the Ghajar era and also the last of its kind, as the fortunes that would allow such expenses soon vanished, both at the court and also with much of the Ghajar aristocracy. And finally, the importance of the court as an example of and template for the aristocracy, um, the elite, and subsequently for the various strata of society at large. Court rituals and practices set the tone for the rest of society and were thus emulated at various levels and to various degrees. These rituals concern celebrations such as marriages, religious observances such as Tazye, holiday celebrations such as Nowruz and Yalda, and forms of dress, etiquette, speech, food, and entertainment, to name a few. Thus, whatever the ceremonies the apex engaged in, the rest of society would follow to the extent their means allowed. This is also attested to by the various marriage celebrations, rituals recorded in the Tariq Azudi and in the notices of Dustali Khan. So now I'd like to um, give a few examples from uh, the Tariq Azudi on the rituals at the court um, and at the practices um, at the court of Fat Ali Shah and the subsequent courts. The first uh, that I, one that I'm referring to is the marriage between Aghabaji and uh, Fat Ali Shah. And as you recall, as I said, part of uh, the um, second part of the wedding, Arusi, is the consummation of the marriage. And in the case of Aghabaji, the marriage was not consummated. And yet she remained at the court. And as I said, she was addressed by foreign queens and potentates as queen during Fat Ali Shah's rule. This is what Sultan Ahmad Mirza says about that particular um, episode. Despite all the honors due her rank, Aghabaji did not gain his majesty's favor when she first came into the imperial household. On the night of the wedding before dawn, without consummating the marriage, his majesty left the wedding chamber saying, the daughter of Ibrahim Khan is like unto a viper. Aghabaji thus remained a virgin till the end of her life. It was said that on the morning of that night, Aghabaji had written a note of complaint to his majesty in the form of a Turkish poem. But her importance remained as, as I said, queen at the court of Fat Ali Shah. And reflecting on the honor and importance of this wife of Fat Ali Shah, 
Sultan Ahmad Mirza relates details of the marriage of two of her nieces to sons of the Shah. Of particular interest here is the wedding of her niece, Begum Agha, to which the Shah attended personally, and this was one of the last weddings that the Shah attended to personally, with the assistance of his favorite Sire wife, Tawus Khanum, Tajid Dole. Um, this vignette is important because as the main panel of the exhibition downstairs shows, the wedding of um, the son of my uh, um, Mamalek and the daughter of Nasiruddin Shah. She was brought to the house of the groom on a gilded litter on an elephant. And this was one of the main attractions of this particular wedding. This tradition is recorded in, in the memoir of um, Fatari Shah's son. And the first time that this was done is in this particular context with the niece of Aghabarji. On the day they brought the, the daughter of Nazar Ali Khan Shah Savan from Ardabil towards Tehran by imperial order, all the grandees of the court were present to welcome her. They put the bride on an elephant litter from Qari Khan to Tehran. This was the first bride during the period of Qajar rule being brought to the wedding feast on an elephant litter. And this was due to her high honor and the high honor to which um, her venerable aunt, Agabaji, was held. The next vignette um, is about, um, refers to Tavus Khanum and the reason why the Takht Tavus is named Takht Tavus. The section below is of historical importance because it clarifies why the Takht Tavus is, is so called. And it also reflects two aspects of marriage, which I have alluded to earlier, the meaning of Arusi, and the views that the prospective brides held on the desirability of permanent versus temporary marriage. A similar refusal to change her status from temporary to permanent wife is recorded by Dust Ali Khan of Fatima Sultan Anis Dole, wife of Nasiruddin Shah, after the death of Jairan. The story of her refusal to change her status and the reasons she gave for her church are almost identical to those given by Tawus Khanum, as recorded here below. Anis Dole had immense and reciprocated love for Nasuddin Shah. She died of grief a year after his assassination, and in one instance weeping over an image of the Shah on a bundle of currency notes presented to her. This particular vignette is about um, Tawus Khanum and her uh, wedding night um, of the marriage to Fatali Shah. At the time, the jeweled throne known as Takht Tavus was known as Takht Khurshid. When the late Shoja Saltane was governor of Tehran, he had been charged with the arrangements for the wedding of Tajid Dole. On the night of the wedding, when they brought Tajid Dole to the residence of the Khagan, that is Fatali Shah, this bed was set up for the married couple. And since that time, this throne is named after that lady as the Takht Tavus. It is interesting because the Takht Tavus has no peacocks on it. It has a sun disk. And um, this has been a matter of speculation as to why it is called the Takht Tavus, and this matter clarifies it. It was named after her in honor of the wedding night that the Shah and she spent on this um, um, throne, which is also bed-like. Um, as I said, Rajars were of tribal origin before they became rulers. And um, they still observed many of the tribal customs and traditions predating their ascendancy to power. The following rules for forging marriage alliances were established from the time of Agha Muhammad Shah and reflected also earlier tribal traditions of the Rajars. The passage below indicates, includes reference to the most important wedding for the Ravanlu Govan, Rajars enabling them to establish peace and end the blood feud between themselves and their rival faction, the Davalus. It is a rare moment of tenderness attested to uh, by the action of Agha Muhammad Shah himself as the elder of the tribe and Shah, and reflects a tradition among tribal chieftains of holding the bridle of the mount of the new bride as she was brought to the house of the groom. Women of Rajar lineage, says Azad uh, Dole, um, women of Rajar lineage who would join the imperial household as wives of imperial princes had several privileges that were not accorded wives of the noble families of the realm. 
First, when a bride would join the imperial household as wife of one of the imperial princes, if she was not from the Rajars, she would be brought sitting on a litter. If she was from the ruling clan, she would have to be brought in sitting on the saddle of a camel. When the bride would mount the camel, the bridle of the camel would have to be held by one of the honored members of the family of the groom to make it possible for the bride to mount. When the daughter of Fatali Khan Davalu, who was the mother of the late crown prince, that is, Abbas Mirza Naib Saltane, was brought for the late Khagan, that is, um, Fatali Shah, it is said that the martyred Shah, that is, Agha um, Mahmad Khan, in order to win over the hearts and minds of the Yukhari Bash, went over himself and took hold of the reins of the camel so that the bride could mount. This was uh, a tribal tradition that is reflected in one of the um, photographs that um, Pedram has put in the exhibition below. It is uh, in the middle, right above one of the um, brocade um, pieces uh, for wedding uh, uh, tables. Uh, the next vignettes that I want to uh, um, refer to are some of the expenses that were um, not spared for uh, royal weddings. How are we doing time-wise? You have around seven minutes. Seven minutes, all right. Um, let me just mention the most, um, the most famous of these. Um, As uh, Iranian specialists know, and, and pe people who are familiar with Iranian history know, that Iran lost the territories above uh, the River Aras uh, in two Russian wars. And um, before that time, these territories were ruled by um, local chieftains or khans or sardars in Farsi, who were um, beholden to um, the royal house, but also were related to them by marriage. And one of the most spectacular uh, marriages um, related to and written about, and, and also the, the wedding contract which exists still, was uh, the uh, wedding of one of the um, daughters of Fatali Shah with one of the Sardars of, of Erevan. And this is what uh, Sultan Ahmad Mirza relates from that particular vignette. Another of these unions, the sounds of Mubarakbad, of which could be heard from this side of the Karaj River to that side of the Aras River, was the betrothal of Shirin Jan Khanum, sister of Sefidule, who was then four years old, to Mehdi Ghuli Khan, son of Hussein Khan Sardar Ghazvini, who was then seven years old. This is similar to the photographs that you see below in that um, children were already betrothed to each other before uh, the marriageable age because these were dynastic um, uh, alliances. This princess was brought from Tehran to Erevan with such pomp and deference that it is difficult to do it justice in words, says Sultan Ahmad Mirza. The number of her servants was such that they occupied 20 pairs of litters, the covers of which were all embroidered with gold thread and pearls. There were three bejeweled domes attached to these litters, with, and the mules pulling these litters had gold bridles. In addition to the servants and attendants, and the silver and gold, the Sardar also added 30,000 tuman worth of lands from his holdings in Erevan to the dowry of the bride. And as I said, this is one of the most celebrated weddings during the Rajar era. Similarly, um, the son of Fatari Shah, Abbas Mirza, then, um, sent uh, an intermediary to ask um, the hand of one of the uh, family members of the Sardar for uh, one of his offspring. The late Naib Sultanes, says Sultan Ahmad Mirza, sent Saif al-Muluk, the son of the late Zel Sultan, from Tabriz to Erevan to bring about a union of his daughter to the son of the Sardar. Saif al relates that after the union was effected, the Sardar threw a fistful of jewels over the heads of the bride and groom. Since it was not befitting for him to pick up anything from the ground, he could not examine the jewels himself. After reaching his residence, however, 
he found two rubies and three emeralds stuck in his hat and in the folds of his waistband. And when he took them to Ghazvin, he sold those five stones for 400 tuman. This story relates well what the actual wealth of the Sardar was, and their wealth was practically um, unlimited. So to conclude, even though this recounting of marriages restricted itself to events relating to the court of Fatari Shah, observers familiar with the reign and the events of Nasuddin Shah's court, of course, know of the one wedding that mirrored even the most spectacular weddings spoken above, namely the wedding of Princess Fatima Khanum Esmat Dole to Amir Dust Muhammad Khan Muayir al Mamalek, the son of Dust Ali Khan Nizam Dole, and father of Dust Ali Khan Muayir al Mamalek, the author of the Memoir of Life at the Court of Nasuddin Shah, which almost perfectly mirrors the earlier memoir by Sultan Ahmad Mirza, from which all of the above vignettes were drawn. In fact, Dust Ali Khan states as much in his introduction when he reminds us that the court of Nasuddin Shah was mirrored on the court of his great grandfather, Fatali Shah. This famous wedding between the daughter of the Shah and the sign of one of the richest, if not the richest family of the Nasiri era was the last wedding that could retrace and emulate some of the splendor of the equally famous weddings mentioned above. Princess Esmati Dole was brought to the house of the groom on an elephant with a gilded litter. litter and brought with her as her dowry all the lands west of the Nasiri, Ira Tehran, known as Mehrabad. Um, those of you who are Iranians know that this was the location of the airport on the, um, um, the previous government and still is one of the airports now. The wedding feast lasted for a week and no expenses were spared for the union of one of the most trusted and faithful families to the Rajar court, whose service to the Rajars went all the way to the time of the great-grandfather of Fatali Shah. After all those years, these two houses were united with great pomp and circumstance in a manner and at an expense that could not be duplicated thereafter. This last great wedding of the Rajar era was indeed the wedding to cap all such weddings, and several of the photographs in the, in the exhibit, as I mentioned, curated by this amazing man uh, that accompany these talks are photographs of the parents of Dustali Khan and retrace the capture of some of the glory of the storied Qajar wedding. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Professor Skandari Qajar. Uh, let me first... So, our next speaker is Dr. Hani Khafipur. Uh, Dr. Hani Khafipur is a specialist in the history of medieval and early modern Iran. His research encompasses the study of infrastructure of power in political orders, theories of state, and political Sufism. He teaches courses on Islamic political doubt and theory, and medieval and modern history and literature of Iran at USC's Department of Middle East Studies. Please join me to welcome uh, Dr. Uh, Hani Hafipur, who will talk about weddings in Safavid Iran as seen by European visitors. Please. Hello, everybody. Um, as you have already guessed, there were many travelers who uh, came to Iran uh, in the early modern period. We're talking about 1500s, 1700s. Um, in the 16th century, their concern was more uh, diplomatic because of the Ottoman Empire that was at war with Europe. So a lot of these Europeans who visited the Safavid court, they were seeking some sort of alliance. In the 17th century, uh, the focus shifts more towards commerce and, and trade, especially for luxury goods. Iran was producing a lot of uh, silk and uh, beautiful carpets and tapestry and that sort of thing. So they came for this mostly. Um, so because uh, uh, the time is really short here, I'm going to focus only on three travelers. Uh, the first person is uh, Sir Thomas Herbert. He was an English traveler. An historian, he was a courtier in the court of Charles the First. Um, the second person is uh, Sir John Chardin. He was a French jeweler and also a traveler. He was um, what you might call a world traveler. He had 
traveled across Europe, uh, across the Islamic world, the Ottoman lands. He came to Iran, stayed there a few years. Uh, he knew languages, he knew a little bit of Arabic, he knew Turkish, and he picked up Persian. Um, and he went on to go to India, so his, uh, his account is, is very detailed and, um, and wonderful to have. Uh, he was also, he's not, he's not your typical jeweler. He was a royal jeweler. He had commissions to create beautiful pieces of jewelry for European courts. He had a commission from an uh, Ottoman sultan. And he came to the Safari court to design jewelry for the courtiers and, and the governors of the Safavids. The third person uh, is Adam Ulerius. Um, he is uh, what we know, uh, more or less a German scholar, mathematician, and a geographer. His account is also very interesting uh, because of his background. These people are, these three folks are um, sort of post-Renaissance men of Europe. Uh, they know their uh, Bible. They know their Greek and Roman histories. Uh, and uh, they have a fascination with the Orient. Uh, so when we read these accounts, they're highly problematic, to say the least. Uh, they're highly biased. But at the same time, they also give you uh, an honest perspective here and there. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm going to highlight some of the things that they say before we move on to, um, to the, the, the descriptions of the weddings. Uh, so what did they see when they came to Safavid Iran? Those of you who are not familiar with the early modern period, uh, the Safavids in the 17th century, once they got established, uh, they sort of, we tend to aggrandize their, their accomplishments. Uh, we use the term the golden age. So uh, these uh, visitors came at a really good period of, of, of Iran's history where there is a stability, there is a flourishing of commerce and trade. Uh, there is religious tolerance, so, and, and they had heard about this. They, they, they were allured by it. So I'm going to show you some pictures. Those of you who are not, uh, have not seen uh, Safavid buildings, this is uh, Maidana Shah, uh, the King's Square, where um, a 17th century European travel, a Venetian, uh, described it as the Maidan is a King's Square, for the size and beauty, it surpasses many of the most beautiful in Europe. As you zoom in, this is uh, uh, looking at the Royal Mosque. You zoom in, this is the front entrance. These are some of the things that these Europeans did see. And you go inside, these are the arches. You could see how magnificent these, these places are. And uh, this is the inner dome of the, uh, of the, the, um, the mosque, the Royal Mosque. And the acoustics of this building is, is phenomenal. Once you sort of stand underneath it and you just snap your hand like this, and it just reverberates. And the reason for that is that they didn't have mac uh, microphones and things like that. So they, they built into the architecture of the mosque some uh, elements of echo. So when people give sermons, everybody could hear. Mm -hmm. um, here's a picture of the Armenian Christian Church Cathedral uh, of Vank. Uh, 17th century Esfahan. From the outside, it looks very simple. Um, this is the inner courtyard. But once you enter, it's one of the most incredible buildings of the period. Uh, these are all uh, biblical stories that has been meticulously detailed and painted on the walls. Um, the dome of a building is the most difficult part of it to build. And uh, this, this building, along with other ones that I showed previously, uh, have just phenomenal uh, architectural designs. So here's another angle of another inner dome. And if you sort of go and, if you can, lay down and look up, this is what you would see. It's absolutely incredible. So they had heard of these things. And so they were sort of attracted by the allure of the Safavid period. Uh, they also were interested in the public bath. Uh, here's some, uh, it's a public bath in uh, New Jolfa, in Esfahan, the Armenian quarters. Um, here's another public bath. And they also came for commerce. This is the Grand Bazaar in Kashan. Uh, they came for the goods, spices, 
tapestry, carpets, and, and various luxury goods. All right, so these travelers who came uh, to Safavid Iran, they came uh, and their travel literature that they produced, uh, it came about a tail end of maybe four centuries of this genre, travel literature that the Europeans were producing. To give you an idea of what these travel literature um, uh, contain, uh, here is the content of Adam Illyrius' uh, travel literature. They talk about the money, the climate, soil and farming, domestic animals, camels, horses, fruit, silk production, one of the main things that uh, they, they sought, uh, the Persian appearance, the Persian vices. This is the part where it gets really interesting. If you are an Iranian, I'm going to put some quotes up in a second, how um, they saw these Persians, they try to sort of categorize them, understand them, they find them amusing at times, odd. Um, so each of these travel literatures has a section on the manners of the Persians, right? Um, again, they, they talk about devices, opium, their occupations, how they school their children, languages, and you could see medicine, astronomy. It's very detailed, especially Adam Olerius, who was a, sort of like a polymath of the, of the 17th century, 18th century people in Europe. Uh, he was interested in a, in a, in a broad range of uh, fields. Um, so you may ask, why are they interested in, in uh, writing the travel literature? Um, a couple of reasons. It, it gives them prestige. They have a ready audience in Europe, so when they come back to Europe, they have uh, this fantastic account to tell, and they want to, they don't want recognition of it. Thank you so much. They want recognition for their effort. It wasn't easy from Europe all the way go back to, to Iran or India, or places like that. So um, it gives them prestige, it gives them entry to different various courts in Europe, and it produces money for them. Um, <clears throat> So a lot of these travel literature, uh, I have actually one of them. This is, um, this is my own copy of uh, uh, Pierre de la Valle, uh, it's a Venetian travel who went to Iran. This is the 1747 copy of it. So they were mass produced like this. And, and they usually have their picture in front of um, the book to show who they are. Um, sort of humility wasn't a thing that they were going for. <laughs> So this is um, uh, Sir John Chardin. He was a French jeweler, as I mentioned earlier. Um, he was a Huguenot, so he found refuge in the, in, the, in the English court, and he was knighted. He became a sir. Um, here is his, uh, the front piece of his book. And as you can tell, it's very similar to this mass-produced copy of, of Pierre de la Valle's book. Um, so... Um, what did he say about uh, the Persians that he saw? Can people see that? Okay, I'm gonna read it for you. The most commendable property of the manners of the Persians, this is how generalized the observations are, uh, is their kindness to strangers, the reception and protection they afford them, and their universal hospitality and toleration in regards to religion, except the clergy <laughs> of the country, who, as in all other nations, hate to a furious degree all those that differ from their opinions. As I mentioned earlier, Sir John Chardin was a world traveler. He had, had encounters with all these people. And, and so he knows that the clergy across the globe are not very uh, tolerable people. Um, he goes on to say, Persians are most lavish in the world and the most careless of the morrow. They cannot keep money and whatever riches fall to them, they waste all in very little time. Let, for instance, the king give 50 or, 50 or 100,000 livres to any man. He lays it out in less than a fortnight, in buying slaves of both sexes, in hiring handsome wives, in setting up a noble equipage, in furnishing a house, or clothing himself richly, and so spends the whole sum so fast without any regard to the time to come. Again, uh, these are gross generalizations. Uh, and he, among the other European travelers, his milieu, the people, his interlocutors, the people he came in contact with, were the elite. Mm -hmm. he, he wasn't going in the, in the villages or places like that. He traveled with the rich people. So this is what <laughs> he, he observes. Um, 
And I mentioned earlier that Chardin picked up Persian. Mm -hmm. So here's some of the things that he know. The Persians having the character of wanton and profuse, one may easily believe them to be lazy. They call the lazy and inactive man sargardun, that is, turning the head this way and that way. Their language is full of interesting terms. For instance, to express a man reduced to mendicant state, they say, he eats his hunger. <laughs> To avoid a tragic term, for instance, if they would say that a man is dead, they say, <laughs> huh? he, he gifted his life to you to extend yours. <laughs> I repeat once more, Persians have the most moving and engaging ways, the most compliant tempers, the smooth and the most flattering tongues. <laughs> Um, okay, Adam Illyrius, uh, the, the German uh, polymath. Uh, these are Renaissance men, as I mentioned earlier. They're, they're worldly. Uh, they know their histories and a little bit of philosophy. But they still are religious people. They still are very good Christians. So when they see something that is at odds with Christianity, uh, they take note of it. Here's one. They use all imaginable inventions to steer themselves up to lust. And to this end, they have at all meetings, whether at common tippling houses or elsewhere, men and women dancers who provoke them to brutality by their obscene postures. I think he's referring to like your typical belly dancers or so. Huh? They use also the seed and leaves of hemp uh, to revive languishing nature, though our naturalists assigned uh, a cold quality, which weakens and corrupts nature. I cannot imagine how this can add any more fuel to their lustful inclinations. <laughs> so again, he's talking about the courtiers, what went on in, in perhaps any courts across the early modern period. You have a bunch of wealthy, powerful men uh, and wealthy, powerful women who want to have fun and have orgies and all that stuff. I don't know if he witnessed any of this stuff, but this is his impression. Uh, this is something that he might have witnessed. This, this is a mural on the Shell Satun Palace in Esfahan, where you could see it's a royal banquet. We could see there are wine being served, there are um, dancing girls, and, and it's, um, it's, it's, a, it's a great banquet. Um, so this uh, to give you an idea of some of the generalization that, uh, and that goes on in these travel literature. Another thing that is very useful for historians uh, is um, their sketches. A lot of these travel literature have visual representations. Um, here is one from uh, Chardin's travel, uh, depicting the, the style of, of the clothing of women at this time. And when you match up what they sketched and what we have, uh, you could see that they were kind of pretty spot on. So here is some of the, uh, the courtiers in the Saf in late Safavid period. And this is the, sort of their outfits. And if you sort of zoom in on what they look like, you could see it, you get a good idea of, of their, um, their fashion. Mm -hmm. uh, here's another one. Again, uh, these are some of the uh, styles that these travelers might have, might have encountered, some of these people. Um, and again, uh, they typecast people. Uh, here uh, in, in Chardin's travel, he had with him a sketcher, a wood engraver, who sort of wanted to describe a Persian sitting. It was odd for them uh, that they would sit on the floor and, and they would say, oh, how uncomfortable it would be. So let's have a, a, a sketch of, of this fellow sitting. Uh, so underneath it would say, Persian sitting. <laughs> And if you match up the outfit, you'll see, oh, he wasn't, he wasn't making some of these things up. They were actually look like this. Um, here's an um, interesting portrait of, of Sir Robert Shirley, uh, the English emissary and, and a man of fortune who visited the Safavids Iran and had an uh, encounter with the Shah Abbas's court. And he was sent back and forth between the, the Safavids uh, and, and the English court. And here you have a good style of uh, the, the Persian nobleman's outfit. 
Uh, it's, a, it's a very expensive outfit, uh, and he is proudly wearing it. In, this was done in, in England. It wasn't done in, in the, the painting wasn't done in Persia. Uh, usually, these are robes of honor, uh, very expensively made with um, uh, silver and gold threads. And so he's, this is a, a point of pride for him to have um, gone so far and been honored by in the outfit that the king had given him. Um, as I mentioned earlier, some of their sketches are extremely valuable for historical analysis. So this is um, uh, a sketch of uh, Tahrir Jamshid, the Persian police, uh, that we have of this period. Uh, that is very useful for people who study uh, ancient ruins of Persian police. Um, this is uh, the Sheikh Lutfullah Mosque in Esfahan. Here you have this sketch of it. Um, here is uh, one of the wings of Ali Rapu Palace, the royal palace in Esfahan, and you have a sketch of it to the right. It kind of gives you an idea of um, uh, how fascinated they were, and they wanted to record these things uh, to take back to Europe and share with their colleagues uh, and, and broader audience. Um, some, uh, many of these travel literature, they, they were translated in multiple languages. Uh, so it kind of gives you an idea of uh, the readership across Europe. Um, here's the caravanserai uh, that they comment on, on profusely. Uh, the city, um, the, the Khaju Bridge in Esfahan. Uh, and here is the, uh, the actual bridge. And so they, they left a pretty good account of what uh, Iran looked like, what some of the manners of, of these Persians were like, and so on and so forth. So now, going to the accounts of the weddings. Now that uh, I hope I give an idea of what this, uh, the genre of travel literature uh, might be. Uh, first, let's start with uh, Sir Thomas Herbert, the English traveler who came to Iran. Uh, as I mentioned, I should mention that they weren't solo travelers. They often traveled uh, with a bunch of people. Hmm? Uh, Adam Illyrius, they came with their own troops. They came with uh, their cooks, their doctors. And, and so it was a, a massive caravan of, of these Europeans that traveled. And I, I think it's mostly for safety reasons. Um, even though Safavi Iran was uh, incredibly safe through, uh, between the cities. And they often comment on this. Um, yeah. Ten more minutes? Gotcha. All right. Um, okay, Sir Thomas uh, Herbert, uh, he produced his travel literature, Travels to Persia, and um, this is what he has to say about uh, Persian weddings. Their weddings have not much variety. They choose their wives more from reports of others than particular acquaintance, the friend of either party commonly uh, making the recommendation, the day of the bride is veiled with a lawn and bravely mounted. A troop of friends accompany her to church, that is the mosque. Uh, in the midway, she is met with an equal number of friends, altogether a grand day is a ceremony. Entering the mosque, the mullah assures parties are in agreement. She demands three things, bed right, food, and clothing. Their fathers having declared themselves content, the priest circles them with a cord, conjoins their hands, takes the reciprocal oath, and calls um, Muhammad to witness. After which, the Ghazi enrolls their names, the hour, day, month, and the year of the nuptial. Uh, so uh, my colleague earlier described a little bit about the details of the distinction between out and out of sea. This sort of uh, wasn't uh, what they... Um, they witnessed. They didn't know about the details of, of RSC. They, they just basically generally observed what, what they saw and they recorded what they saw. Uh, what's interesting about Sir Thomas Herbert's uh, account, he records one of the rarest uh, weddings, a rural wedding that happened in the early 17th century. Uh, native sources, they rarely record these sort of self-evident events. So it's, it's very valuable that Europeans or visitors, they take note of things that natives usually take for granted. So a rural wedding uh, is a very rare thing for anyone to witness. Even, even a, a wedding that uh, 
to, to even to record it, you would have to be there at the right place at the right time to witness it. Uh, so this is a very good account that he left behind. We pass by a black tent. This is on the uh, slopes of Mandamavan. This is northern Iran. We pass by a black tent pitched in a pleasant place near the road, filled with above 30 women and men. Usually weddings are segregated in the cities. Men are on one quarter and women are on the other quarter. But here you get a glimpse of this, uh, this convention is not observed in a rural area which at first I thought was a solemn event, but it proved a wedding. Staying there a while, we saw the bride, about 10 years of age, but the groom was 30. I don't know how he knows the ages. I think he's just guessing. But he knows that the bride is very young, the, the groom uh, is older. Many bridesmaids came out to admire us, whom we no less wondered at, for their faces, hands, and feet were upon that solemn occasion, painted in various forms with birds, beasts, castles, and flowers, their arms and legs chains with bracelets, or rather fetters of brass and silver. So this is one of the rare occasions that we have in Safavid uh, um, uh, sources of a, of a rural wedding, and it's very valuable for people interested in social history. Um, and he continues to describe what went on. In, in a different wedding in a city. The first day vapors away in tobacco, feast, and other joviality, men and women being severed. This is what I mentioned there in different quarters. At night, the bride enters the chamber where she is washed and perfumed. Next night, they bathe together, and seven days after, in which time, if he discovers, discovers her to be no virgin, she is returned to her parents with dishonor. Otherwise, kept until death, makes the divorce. Adam Olerius, uh, he has another observation. A great quantity of wine and food is served at weddings. Persons of any learning who come to these entertainments, instead of drinking, divert themselves with their books, which to that end they bring along with them, and, spread, and spend the time in discourses of morality or speculative philosophy. Their poets are never wanting at these feasts, and contribute very much to the festivity thereof, especially the next day after the wedding and the day after. So you can see the distinction between a rural wedding and maybe an elite wedding, where there is wine being served, there's a prohibition against wine, but this is not, uh, not for weddings. Something that these good Christians uh, took a note of was polygamy. As you know, in Christianity, you're not supposed to do that, uh, but not in Islam. So this is what Herbert had to say about this. First, observe that polygamy is tolerable for Muhammad to excuse his own infirmity, but borrowing it from the Romans. Their common excuse is to furnish the emperor with soldiers for defense, paradise with saints, and to resound the meritorious praises of their Muhammad. The dervishes, an order of begging friars, accepted who from a transcendent conceit of their own purity forbear matrimony. The men, the, they marry none of another religion, but use such as slaves or concubines. So he knew, he knew the Islamic law. Four wives um, the law tolerates, concubines are unlimited. So you could imagine that you can imagine that he, he was in conversation with people who knew the tradition of, of polygamy in Iran. Um, here's what Adam, uh, Adam Illyrius uh, has to say uh, about temporary marriage, who my, uh, my dear colleague here sort of introduced earlier in his talk. There are two other kinds of matrimony among the Persians. Uh, I brought this up because it's rather controversial in the Islamic world. The Sunnis believe that this is legalized prostitution. For the Shi'is, they justify it in various ways, that it provides social protection for the woman in a time where you don't have social welfare. And the offspring of, if there will be kids, they are um, allowed to have inheritance and they have full legal rights. And they're not considered uh, illegitimate or bastards. So he says, there are two other kinds of matrimony among the Persians which are not celebrated. For those who are obliged to sojourn at other places beside 
those where their ordinary habitations are, yet are unwilling to visit brothels, take wives for a certain time, allowing them a certain salary, either for a month or such term as they agree upon. This is very spot on if you study uh, temporary marriages. Actually, I brought a book because it's, uh, it's a very interesting topic. It's called The Law of Desire by Shahla Ha'eri. In the back of this book, the library has this, has accounts of these temporary marriages in modern Iran from both men and women who engage in temporary marriages and the reasons why they do this. So if you're interested, it's called The Law of Desire. Okay, they call this kind of marriage meteh or mut'ah. And to dissolve it, there is no need of bulls of divorce, but the time of the contract being expired is to dissolve uh, of itself unless both parties are mutually content to prolong it. And he goes on to say this, whence it comes that rich merchants who are obliged to travel up and down the country, marry wives and keep houses in several places that wherever they come, they may be at home. So he's hinting towards this is not something that everybody engages in, rich merchants. Huh? It is impossible also that a family where there are so many women can be free from jealousy, which is inevitable among those who would all be loved and absolutely depend on him who should but cannot love them all equally. The Persians themselves, to express the inconvenience of polygamy, say in their proverb that as two donkeys are more troublesome to be driven than a whole caravan. I have heard many stories of how such marriages have produced grave misfortunes for the husband. The third kind of marrying is when a man makes use of a slave that he has, brought, he has bought and these slaves are the most part Christian maids from Georgia uh, whom the Tatars of Dagestan, this is in the Caucasus, northern Iran, that uh, my dear colleague pointed out, was lost to Russia in the 19th century. It was part of the Safavid Empire, and this is where you get non-Muslim slaves. Uh, so they were sort of kidnapped and brought down to Safavid Iran and sold. The children, this is what uh, I was referring to earlier, and Adam Ulurius knew about this because uh, I'm sure he was in contact with people who engage in this kind of affair. The children which they bear, as also those born in their marriage called mut'a, temporary marriage, share in their father's state, the same as the others who have no other advantage over those of the mother by her permanent contract of marriage, nikah. They are all accounted lawfully begotten. Uh, by way of conclusion, these descriptions of the wedding celebration gives us a rare opportunity to glimpse at an important life event that was consistently overlooked by the Iranian literati of the time. Even though the legal and legitimizing feature of marriage were rigidly grounded in the Islamic tradition, the celebration with the presence of wine, musicians, and dancers, um, below the lines of tradition and Islamic law. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Uh, Hani Khafipur. Uh, very interesting historical background since that every period, amazing introduction. Thank you so much. Uh, we go to, uh, our next speaker, for those who are late, again, uh, I'm really honored that Dr. Amir Hussein Pujabadi accepted our invitation to be part of this uh, talk program today. Uh, Dr. Uh, Amir Hussein Pujabadi is director of the Iranian music program in UCLA's Department of Ethnomusicology. He earned a BA in music from the University of Tehran and a PhD in ethnomusicology from CUNY Graduate Center. He served as assistant professor of music at the University of Tehran for nine years until 2014 and has written extensively on the history, theory, and performance practice of Persian music. I would like to add, again, he's one of the only specialists of music during Qajar period Iran with very extensive personal archive. 
Uh, when any further, I would like to invite Dr. Prud Javadi, who will talk today for us on music in Persian weddings in the late Qajar period. Please join me to welcome <laughs> Dr. Prud Javadi. Uh, uh, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you, Farhang Foundation, for uh, arranging this uh, uh, wonderful event, and also uh, uh, Dr. Khosrow uh, Najad for inviting me uh, to be here today. Uh, the, the title of my talk is um, Wedding Music in the Late Qajar Period. Um, marriage in the Qajar period follows traditions often based on religion, culture, and social norms and different types of music were performed at marriage ceremonies, including during the wedding celebration. In this talk, I would like to introduce the music performed in urban weddings in the late 19th century while identifying various troops of performers in this period. In the second half of the 19th century, the wedding tradition had a robust form in Tehran. I tried to concentrate on the capital. And it consisted of uh, two major stages, each comprising a sequence of events. OK, these are the two stages of the uh, uh, marriage. Starts with Khasagari, proposal, and then Baleboran, Hanabandan, Hammam Aqd, uh, and the next stage starts with Aqd, uh, Arusi, uh, Patakhdi, and Madarzan Salam. These are, uh, uh, this, uh, this is the sequence of events that is uh, described by Jafar Shahdi uh, in his book. The first stage consisted of ceremonies such as Khasagari and Balleboran that were unaccompanied by music, and also uh, ceremonies like Hanabandan and Hammam Aqd that uh, were both accompanied by music. Two significant events in the second stage, Aqd and Arusi, were both accompanied by music, and between the last two, only uh, Patakhti was musical. The Hammam Aqd, uh, Hanabandan and Patakhti were typically all female events in which the female friends, family members, cousins, in-laws, aunts, sisters, mothers, and grandmothers were all invited to participate. The women would sit in a circle in a large room leaving space for professional female musicians, motrebs, and dancers to perform. The traditional families, especially those with religious background, uh, often avoided uh, to bring uh, musicians to their homes. Uh, in their ceremonies, they only had one or two female singers who performed tasnifs, metric songs, and accompanied themselves on the frame drum or daire. Uh, traditional families in Iran, especially uh, with uh, you know, religious backgrounds uh, usually avoided to have uh, musical instruments at their houses. That's why they uh, never invited uh, musicians. Uh, in the wedding celebration, male and female gatherings, majlis mardane, and majlis mardane and majlis zanane were separated. Both, um, but both were held at the same time in two adjoining houses. Sometimes one male and one female troops of musicians, that's the motreb, including performers of musical instruments, singers, dancers, and mokalled. Mokalled is a person who performs various forms of stand-up com comedy. Um, these are the mokalleds of uh, uh, the late Qajar period. This is uh, Sheikh Karna, who was uh, the most prominent Mughalid at the court of uh, Nasruddin Shah. 
uh, it's quite interesting the, uh, the type of, uh, uh, you know, taglid, which is stand-up comedy that they performed at that time. Um, you know, we have some recordings from, uh, early recordings from these people. Uh, I'm going to play one of them. Uh, in this situation, the ubiquitous pond hose, uh, usually located in the center of the uh, courtyard, was covered with uh, boards to platform to form a platform and an ensemble of musicians, male or female, depending on the majlis, would sit there and uh, perform. This type of uh, music was actually uh, called uh, Ruhozi or Tahta Hozi. So uh, they had boards on hose or the pound, and musicians, it, this formed a platform for musicians to sit on the um, platform and perform. Um, this was uh, usually, um, this happened usually in the case of uh, uh, wedding ceremonies, mostly. Uh, other than that, um, you know, it was um, somehow expensive to hire professional musicians for, you know, uh, informal occasions. So, um, mostly in the case of uh, Arusi, uh, these musicians were invited. In the late 19th century, numerous musical ensembles were active as Dasti Motreb, mostly in the uh, Udlajan district of Iran. Udlajan was uh, one of the districts of Tehran uh, where hosted all these uh, motreps. Um, while celebrated dastes would mostly be hired to perform at the court or the homes of noblemen and wealthy mer merchants, less prominent dastes also performed at the homes of the middle class citizens. Ojen Oban reports that in the late Qajar period, about 14 male ensembles, Dasti Mardane, and more than 40 female ensembles, Dasti Zanane, were registered in Tehran, all of whom paid monthly taxes to the court. It's interesting that the person um, at the court who was in charge of um, you know, collecting taxes uh, was called Noyebe. Uh, Nagar Khane was the musical institution at the court, and Nayeb was the deputy. Um, he was the one who um, was in charge of arranging for these uh, motreps to come at the court and perform, both in the Khalvat, uh, which was the uh, male section of the court, and also Andarun, which was the uh, female quarter of the court. And um, he uh, kind of arranged with these musicians to uh, receive a percentage, a percentage of, uh, uh, you know, their, uh, uh, their salary for himself. And the person who was in charge of Noibe Nagar Khane in the Nasiri period was Karim Shirei, who is very famous. And the other one um, was uh, uh, Ismail Bazaz. This one is Ismail Bazaz, who had uh, himself a troupe of uh, musicians. And uh, he uh, widely performed at the court. He also had uh, um, dancing boys. As you see, he's, uh, he's having a dancing boy you know, next to him. Member, members of these urban ensembles, known as motrebs, were mostly hereditary professional performers, and they could uh, be either Muslim or Jewish. Jews, however, 
dominated the performance of dance in particular, as many Jewish dancing boys and girls were reportedly active throughout major cities. The majority of uh, urban ensembles maintained at least one kamonche and one dombak. Kamonche and dombak uh, were uh, the stereotypical instruments associated uh, by uh, associated to the Motreps in the Qajar period. The second most popular musical instrument among them was tar. Santur was less common in general, but uh, it was still played every now and then by both male and female musicians. Harmonium was um, primarily played by women, while nail was an instrument that belonged um, exclusively to the male domain. Uh, by the late 19th century, some Western musical instruments, such as violin, flute, and even mandolin, were also introduced and adopted by some of these uh, dastes. Uh, in this picture, as you see, it's a, um, uh, it's a daste zanone, or female ensemble, uh, which um, feature, features um, a doyere player, you know, in the left, uh, a tar player, a santul uh, player on the, uh, in the middle, and also a tombak player. And the person who is um, sitting on the uh, sofa and smoking a uh, water pipe um, is probably uh, the proprietor or the owner of the daste. Uh, during the reign of Nasser Din Shah, the most distinguished urban ensembles in Tehran were directed by two blind male musicians and several female performers who were primarily singers and dancers. The owners of female ensembles, that is, had close connections with the women of the Andarun, and they were frequently invited to perform at the court. Some of the ensembles were uh, the ensemble of blind men. He was a blind musician, and um, he, um, he was the owner of uh, an ensemble, and he usually performed with um, uh, his uh, family members. Uh, the other one was uh, Blind Karim in this picture. In this picture, um, it's probably um, you know blind moment who is sitting with um, his troop in the middle of the Andarun, and all these uh, you know Hajjas eunuchs are standing over there. And um, there's also windows, as you see in the uh, right side. Uh, most of the time, um, women at the, women of the court were standing behind these windows and watching the scene. Uh, they were not supposed to uh, come to the courtyard. Uh, the other ensembles included Dasteye Baji Qadam Shad, who was a uh, who was a woman of woman of um, African descent. Uh, she was black. Uh, the other one was uh, also Zafran Baji, who was also um, black, and um, Galin was uh, another daste. Uh, Galin herself was a singer, and um, she was active um, during the reign of Muzaffar Adin Shah. Beside the above dastes, um, several other uh, female troops and independent female performers were active at the court. Here is um, a troupe of musicians uh, owned by Dawood Shirazi. Yeah, Yahudi. He was the most. Uh, there's something wrong with this. Mm. Okay. Here, yeah, Dawood Shirazi. Uh, he was a Jewish musician who play, who um, was a tar player, and he had um, uh, a troop of musicians and dancing boys. Uh, the young. Um, boys who are sitting uh, on the front row, 
uh, are dancing boys actually. And um, the, other the other people who are sitting in the back are musicians, are uh, um, instrument players. He himself is holding guitar, as you see, and uh, his son is also uh, playing the um, tone back. This, is, this event, this particular event, is the wedding ceremony of um, Aziz al-Sultan or Mari Jack at the court. Uh, in the year uh, 13, 12, one year before the assassination of uh, Nasreddin Shah. This picture um, is taken at the, um, at the uh, wedding ceremony of uh, uh, Muhammad Ali Shah. And um, these are uh, female musicians who were invited to perform uh, for his uh, uh, wedding. Besides the above dusters, as I said, several other female troops and independent female performers were active in Tehran during the reign of Nasreddin Shah. For instance, Gohar Khomari directed a troupe in which she sang and played daf. The ensemble of Azizah Atta and Tawus were also more frequently brought to the court to perform uh, at banquets. Among the female performers, sometimes two or three sisters formed a small daste, or an ensemble, and performed at all female gatherings. Munes and uh, Anis, for instance, were famous sisters in this period. While Munes was um, an accomplished dancer, her sister Ghazal was a tasnif singer and a doyere player. These, are, um, these um, female performers were usually invited to perform in um, uh, at the time of you know Hanabandan or uh, uh, mm, other occasions, but uh, uh, Arusi, which was supposed to be a very uh, big event, and um, they usually invited uh, a bigger ensemble to perform. Likewise, some of the dancers, such as Khum, uh, Kamar Saleki were Tasnif singers. Most of them, as I mentioned earlier, were Tasnif singers. They, uh, they just uh, performed uh, songs. Uh, Motrips were the predominant exponents of light and rhapsodic forms of Persian music. They never performed rigid and elaborate dasgahs, which um, with sequences of gushes. So um, the type of music which was usually performed by this uh, motreps was kind of a light song and light instrumental pieces. They were not exponents of uh, uh, Persian classical music, which was known at that time as uh, dasko and gushe and radif. Um, they only performed uh, you know, light metric songs and instrumental dance tunes. Uh, these are other uh, ensembles at that time that were uh, pretty much active uh, in the late 19th century and early 20th century. Uh, th this is one of the ensembles um, which was formed by three sisters. Um, and they were all Jewish, and uh, they were Jewish, actually, performers. Uh, the person who is sitting in the middle was a, is a tar player, and the other two sisters, Ghazal and Maral, uh, were dancers. This is also uh, another. Um, now let's uh <laughs> This is one of the early recordings made by uh, 
Iftikhar, who was uh, one of the most prominent uh, female singers at the uh, end of the Qajar period. She frequently uh, performed in uh, all these occasions. And you can also hear the sound of uh, the ensemble. It gives you some idea how the music sounded in this period. Uh, one of the most um, celebrated uh, musicians in the past um, 100 years was uh, Shekhar Shirazi, uh, who was from Shiraz, and uh, uh, she, uh, he uh, mostly performed in uh, uh, wedding celebrations almost uh, for uh, three or four decades. Uh, eventually he went to, he was a Jewish musician, and uh, eventually he went to Israel and uh, passed away there. But um, I'm just going to uh, uh, play uh, one of the songs that uh, uh, he frequently performed in wedding celebrations. This is from the early Pahlavi, from the Pahlavi period, but it's quite interesting too. Okay. Uh, I also have to mention that the most prominent wedding vocal genre in Iran, especially in Shiraz and Fars regions, was um, called Wasunak. Wasunak was a form of, uh, you know, wedding song. And it was um, usually a rhymed couplet based on Ramal poetic meter. Uh, the poetic meter was fa'elatun, 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 fa'elatun. And it was predominantly performed by female singers um, in the uh, uh, wedding ceremonies. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to uh, find any example of uh, a female performer uh, singing a wasunag. But again, um, I have uh, Shikhar Shirazi, the same uh, musician, uh, performing a wasunag. خانم اجازه بدید ازشون خواهش کنیم یه واسونک شیرازی هم برامون بخونه چون واسونک یکی از ترانه های واقعا اصیل شیرازی و اینطور که میدونم شکرم واقعا خوب اجرام میدونم خواهش بکنم خواهش بکنم شکر ممکنه یه واسونک شیرازی برامون بکنیم من تفت خواهش بکنم خواهش بکنم خواهش بکنم خواهش Oh, I don't 
uh, as I said, he was among the last generation of uh, uh, Motrebs who um, performed these uh, songs, especially in uh, wedding ceremonies. And uh, uh, nowadays, I can't think of any uh, other person who continues, uh, you know, uh, uh, maintaining this tradition. So it's uh, it's a uh, it's a dying tradition, or uh, we can all even say that uh, it died, you know, almost uh, uh, before the revolution or right uh, after the revolution of Iran. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Doctor. Um, Pujabadi for such an interesting, attractive, performative talk. We are very tight uh, on time, so I try to uh, be very short for mine, but uh, as I cannot introduce myself, I ask Professor Skandari Rajar to just introduce me, and then I go through my presentation. <laughs> Well, he doesn't need any introduction, really. But um, his uh, bi uh, bio is, is, is long and uh, storied and full of accolades. But I'll just read what he has given me. He obtained his PhD at the École des Hautes Études en Sciences Sociales in Paris and is currently adjunct professor of religion and society religious cluster, uh, uh, research cluster at Western Sydney University. He has taught in four continents um, and teaches all around the world, so uh, truly also a world traveler, and is a fellow at the Department of Anthropology at Harvard University. Previously, uh, Pedram Khosrowajad worked at, uh, as the Associate Director of Iranian Persian Gulf Studies at Oklahoma State University and the Goli Rais Larizadeh Chair uh, of the Iran Heritage Foundation for the Anthropology of Iran in the Department of Social Anthropology at St. Andrews in Scotland. Uh, his research interests include cultural and social anthropology, the anthropology of death and dying, um, on which he has published uh, extensively, visual anthropology, visual piety, devotional artifacts, and religious material culture with a particular interest in Iran, Persianate societies, and the Islamic world. He is the chief editor of the Anthropology of Contemporary Middle East and Central Eurasia, ACME. Please welcome Pedram Khosranija. Well, thank you so much, Professor Rajar. Uh, I know it's late here, and uh, you want to reach home and family. Uh, once again, I say thank you to Farhang Foundation to give all of us this opportunity to have the, this magnificent exhibition. I don't dare to say that. Let's repeat and again, repeat and again in the history of Iranian studies around the world. This exhibition is the first ever event on Arusi and Persian wedding. Believe me or not, we don't have any academic contribution as an article, book, or chapter, what is Arusi among modern Persian society? So these four talks today also, I mean, not me, but the others, consider as the first time that really we talk and discuss these things. And also, it's lovely that if you can, if we can put it in the context with the exhibition that we have here. As, and this is why it's important, the really decision made by Farhang Foundation. Let me again thank you, Executive Chief and all people in Farhang Foundation. So the exhibition, as you understood, chosen very nicely the title 150 Years of uh, Persian Wedding Traditions, covers the art, material, culture, and objects from the 1860s or 50s, Qajar era Iran, to 1979 prior to Iranian revolution, all right? Don't forget, it was not Islamic revolution, Iranian revolution. So, and mostly the idea was to collect material culture, art objects, including photographs. For those creatures like me, who we are visual anthropologists, 
I'm not a rhinologist. Let me shoot on my own feet. I'm social anthropologist and visual anthropologist. Therefore, in visual anthropology, we look at photographs as a material culture, as objects, which we want to go through them to see and discover what we cannot find in literature, what photographs can tell us beyond the image, who was the photographer, who was the sitter, what was the relationship between owner, author of photograph, and those that we can see inside the photographs? What were the intentions? And again, wedding and arousy topic is marvelous. Because as you can see down the stairs, a majority of these plays, especially fourth on the second level, uh, you have many, many, many uh, different topics, family photographs, photo portraits, a wedding. So if I resume in our exhibition, uh, the first group of uh, material culture that we have and which are very important and delicate, uh, kept lovely by families, are wedding contracts. What I wanted to encourage all of the Iranian families and the other families, keep them safe. I see here new generation among us of Iranians may be born here. So I would like to encourage all of you to chase your grandparents and see where are their wedding documents, contracts, save them, frame them, scan them, and keep them for future generations. And if you need to know more, I'm happy after talk or the other days give talk to you in the galleries about them. So as you can see here, they are objects that by call of Fairhang Foundation, you, you family submitted to us. And you can see how beautifully the art of Qajar area, Iran, Tashib, watercolor, calligraphy, included all together. And it, was, it is a combination of many artists of those period that today really we lost that tradition. And in the latest displays down, it says you can see how today maybe the wedding documents they look like. Beautifully, you know, this is the combination of Islamic art and Persian, let's say, art and thinking. Also, other material cultures are wedding. Uh, yesterday, I hope some of you, you could come here and see the wedding table that we had. If not, simply just Google it. You have 100 photographs of beautifully. Now we have one spread for wedding, but Back to Rajar period, mostly for each object, we had different type of these textiles. So it was the job of uh, the women of the family uh, to sit during a year, make these things to put the objects of wedding spreads to make it. So as you can see, different sizes, different uh, types, different colors, embroideries, and art. Uh, were used to create this material culture that again today disappeared from our country and families again. If you have such objects, encourage parents, grandparents, take care of them, repair them, frame them, and keep it safe for future generations. As you can see, silver broderies on the velvet was very uh, eminent art for royal families and aristocrat families during Qajar period. So also the depiction of Persian weddings was very popular during the Qajar period. Let me be clear, nowhere else in the world, in Islamic communities, you don't have any type of figurative paintings because based on Islamic law, figuration is banned. And Iran is one of the only countries since 11 centuries allowed the mixture of pre-Islamic traditions with the Islamic traditions and bring it out for figurative paintings, mostly in the service of royal courts, royal families, royal uh, palaces. So back to Rajar period. Another rare documents are uh, 
watercolor and tempera paintings depicting wedding uh, sessions. As you can see here, we have six uh, frames or six palettes. I'm very grateful to Bonhamen that gave us right to use uh, these good uh, reproductions of the original Qajar document. As you can see, you can go down the search too. Uh, one by one, introduction uh, of mail to the family of uh, Arus, if you want. Then you have a cleric who's sitting with the family for preparation of contract of wedding that you have many of them downstairs. And again, uh, this is the cleric that uh, recite the khutbe act, uh, some part of religious uh, or Quranic verses behind the curtain because they, they have no right to see the ladies, no? Or like Amir Hussein showed us inside the harem, they should be blind, don't see women. And, you know, go on and go on. So painting also helps Iranian wedding art and material culture. Oops. What happened? Well, let me back to original presentation. Well, apparently it doesn't like help me to go to others, but I just use uh, one of the, our most popular displays, which back cover the talk of Professor Iskandari Qajar. Here you have the famous wedding uh, that they moved the bride with the elephant to the house. Left-hand side, you have Amir Gus Muhammad Muayyir Mamalek, and right-hand side, you have Esmatulun the daughter of Nasser al-Din Shah. And here you have the mother of Amir Dus Muhammad, Gul Nesa Khano. The cover and main poster of uh, our program is from this. And here is very important that I say thank you to Dr. Human Sarshar, uh, the owner of Kimia Foundation that borrowed us these images for being used in this program. But Again, here I want to bring your attention to the service of photography. At that period, don't think that uh, photography was something cheap and every family had uh, you know, the photograph machine to take these things. Maybe in Iran, maybe one or two king and this family, as Professor Qajar said, maybe even they were wealthier than Nasser Din Shah, they could have this art and object at home. Uh, so, I want to just bring your attention to, again, the importance of family photographs and albums. And these photographs coming from the last great, great uh, children of the Moyer family, I was lucky that uh, being in touch with them and uh, talk to them how to preserve it. And this is how uh, now we are sure the albums are safe here in LA from Iran, big trajectory, but now they are in good hands for the usage of everyone. And also below you will see two very important documents of wedding at that period. Both families should prepare a list of guests, a list of things that they should buy, exactly like today. A year in advance, both families prepare a big list, what we should buy, who we should invite, and so again, if in your family you have such a documents, please, please, please preserve them, uh, frame them, scan them, and keep them safe for uh, next generation. I will stop here. What I wanted just to say, again, put in the context previous talks of my colleagues with the objects that we have dancers in displays. Uh, exhibition will be open till the end of May. Don't hesitate to be in touch and come and visit it. And now I open the floor for questions, general comments, suggestions that you have for my colleagues, for myself, and for Farhang Foundation for now and future. Please, don't be shy and raise your hand if you have anything to say, question, or comment. I actually have a question for you. I'm a messenger. Um, is, was it a custom that most musicians were Jewish back then, or just coincidence? Uh, no, most of, uh, you know, a large number of uh, Muslims were Jewish in you know, a large uh, this, was, this was a profession which was dominated by Jews. And can you also explain the concept of dancing boys? The concept of dancing boys is very complex. So, <laughs> um, 
they uh, they were selected uh, as they were very young by you know the uh, these owners of uh, uh, ensembles, and um, uh, they had to sign a contract with the court actually to raise these boys and provide them with food and uh, you know clothing and uh, housing and everything and. Uh, uh, most of them actually provided, uh, you know, horizontal services for their uh, customers too. And, uh, you know, most of the time, uh, at a certain age, you know, when they were not, they were no longer active, uh, they uh, usually continued their career as, uh, uh, as, a, uh, as a musician, mostly a counter player or a comeback player, but they stayed with you. Uh, you know, business. Uh, but when they were dancing, boys, they dressed as women. They dressed as women, and they also had uh, long hair let down. Uh, and uh, you know, it's quite interesting that uh, this long hair was called was uh, zolf, and these uh, dancing boys are called mozalaf. Mozalaf was a person who has long, uh, you know, uh, hair let down. Which is not really charming terminology in modern Persian. So when you use it, it's very negative. Any other question? Please. I'm Rosijan. Do you want to come here to the podium, please? I think it's... Yes. Um, so I noticed that in your presentation, you, uh, you made a pretty clear distinction between like male performers and female uh -huh. performing groups. But then in your photos that you had, there were several of them that I think appeared to have both genders. That's right. That's right. The, these, are, these were usually, uh, you know, family uh, troops. Uh, most of them related, you know, uh, their cousins or their brothers, sisters. Uh, yeah. Any other question? For any other speakers, any message for Fahang Foundation? <laughs> so, uh, once again, if there is no question or thing, I should say thank you to Department of Middle Eastern Studies at USC, all colleagues in the library, especially Tyson and Anna Marie, and especially speakers. Thank you, Professor Iskandari Qajar, Dr. Pujabadi, and Dr. Khafipur. And thanks again. For all of you to till now stay with us, and special thanks really goes again to uh, Professor Shahla Bahawar. Thank you, Shahla John, for everything. And uh, I'm sure this is again not the last uh, collaboration will grow up between Farhang Foundation and USC. And I think maybe uh, you, Alice John, will give some words for closing. No? All right then. So thank you, everyone. And I wish you a very good afternoon. Thank you.